Tall Child World. Yeah, big up Tiny in his book, innit? You feel me? R.I.P. Fox, my nigga. Fox approached his 50th birthday with mixed feelings. On one hand, putting aside his disappointment he was spending it behind bars, he was also thankful because he was still in good shape and lucky, blessed even, to be certain of release from prison, period, after the judge had dropped all serious charges. On the other hand, he was pissed, frustrated, as he anticipated that his co-defendant and son, Cody, and his other Cody, Dachavelli, brother of the female rapper, Steflon Don, would not be so fortunate. They were young, hard-headed. Cody and Dutch had refused to take his advice regarding what defence was best to run with with their trial. Fox raised himself up and off the army like perfectly creased white sheeted single bed. He sighed, kissed his teeth and glanced around his 8x10 prison cell. Spotless. OCD. The black and gold Versace dressing gown, matching slippers that iced out Roly were the only visual indication he was money. He picked up a towel, splashed some water on his face over the cereal-sized bowl sink. A square mirror attached to the wall revealed his bald head required slight attention. He walked over to the open cell window. Ship view. High fences. Barbed wire. Open, deserted fields. Fox sniffed the fresh air and reflected on the game. Past, present, future. He felt a deep sense of pride and satisfaction to still be alive. Many others in his team had lost their lives to the game. He missed Nicky. One of his closest teenage friends who had been gunned down in the early 1990s. He could still picture the scene as vividly as, as if it was yesterday. Nicky and Fox drinking champagne and enjoying their celebrity status in the East End nightclub. The big chrome machine in the booter's left hand. Bang! Bang! Nicky's career was finished once the first bullet touched base. Fox closed his eyes and thought of Kenny, his right hand man who was executed on Father's Day he sat in his BMW whip on Clacton Square. Boom, boom, boom. Yo, dickhead. Boom, boom. The glass and hollow tips which rained down on Kenny made it clear his murder was personal. The LOM boss, Fox's boss, Escobar, suffered the same fate. Fox and Escobar had travelled together to North London Council Estate. Escobar's intention was to squash what he thought was a trivial beef between his baby's mother's younger brother and a few local G's. Love All Money members Buffhead and Scatter rolled in convoy, but parked a short distance away from Escobar's whip. Fox leaned back in the passenger seat and watched Escobar walk towards the block of interest. He abruptly sat up in his seat when he saw what looked like a hundred savage looking teenagers appear out of nowhere and began chasing Escobar. He was stabbed repeatedly and switched off by lead. Fox had a ringside seat and hoped no one glanced in his direction. He was unarmed, but now felt no guilt as he had pleaded the case for them to roll heavy. Escobar ruled against, and a decision would cost him his life. Then there was Wayne, Fox's biological brother and also a civilian, who was also executed in cold blood outside his local gym for the sole purpose of sending a message to Fox, who was incarcerated at the time. A single tear ran down Fox's right brown cheek. Wayne's death was unnecessary, and one of the very few regrets he had. There was a number of suspects, nothing concrete. He opened his eyes, took a deep breath, and was surprised to find he was holding the cell window bars with both hands, a little tighter than he would have liked. Fox then thought about Tiny, his early 2000 go get em shutdown pile who was fresh home from rubbing a long one. He had heard niggers were moving jumpy. Understandable. The unpredictable Joe Pesky. I should link him when I land. He would just relight fires I'd work hard to put out, thought Fox. Fuck that. The game would change. Friends were now foe, foe were now friends. 
Fox had sworn to himself that he would never again become emotionally attached to the game. He switched his mindset to the more positive thoughts and thought about his close pal, Anthony Joshua, the British heavyweight champion of the world. He and Anthony had created many epic nights in the most exclusive nightclubs in London. They had been introduced by the plug, one of London's most prolific drug traffickers. Fox and Anthony had just clicked. Their conflicting occupations had become irrelevant. Two hours later, Fox phoned Tiny who was in the library, laptop open, iPhone on silent. He was seated in a corner, partioned off by chrome and glass, tastefully designed to look and feel contemporary. He was surrounded by shelves of new and used books. Contained with knowledge, he found it inspiring. He was working on his latest project. Blowback, a revenge thriller about two white guys, Tom and Sam, who had made a pact to avenge the execution of their fathers. They were gunned down and double crossed by a black underground bad boy, tiny typed, tunnel vision. Creating story and characters felt like creating life and death. He was addicted to his craft. Fox's name flashed up on his phone. He'd been expecting the call. There was a small conference room to his left, behind a shelf of law books, and barely visible to the naked eye. The door to it had a small glass window. Inside was a plush, mafia-styled long glass table, white leather chrome seats, black electric blinds which were half open, and a black and white plaque above the door which spoke volumes. Never give in. Study hard. Never give up. Tiny opened and closed the door behind him and took the call. Yo, Tiny. Yeah, who's this? My bad man friend who switched sides, replied Tiny, as he slid into the soft leather seat at the end of the table. Fox laughed. What the fuck are you talking about? You're wrong with Smitty, ain't you? That don't mean I switch sides. What does it mean then? His business brother. Okay. Business, yeah? Our issue was never with a fat boy. You know this. Mark manipulated him to get involved in our thing. Makes no difference, bro. Like, don't get it twisted. I actually think Smith is cool. Like, the last time I saw him, we bleached the whole night in Belmars block. Yeah, he told me. The following morning, Tiny continued, he was being transferred to the Ville. He came to my door and bust a flap. You know what he said to me? What'd he say? Don't let me down, you know. I don't want a dead fiddle boy, see, you know. That's what I'm saying, bloody, Blocks pleaded. He weren't fairly marked from way back then. You're missing the point, blood. What's the point? Look, even though we got on, bleached, exchanging war stories, the following morning, he and I both knew we were still ops. And that's why he said what he said. It's what you're saying. If you saw him now, you would squeeze. I ain't saying that. But what are you saying then? I'm rehabilitated. My pen is now my weapon of choice. However, I won't be dumb enough to give him my head back. Silence. Then Fox spoke. You've been away nearly two decades. The game's different. It's like someone got two decks of cards and shuffled up the old thing. The LOM thing's dead, buddy, come on. We won the war. North Star's popped down. Mark ain't even on the chessboard. I see the pussy over Essex. Me and two of my G's shook, calling me by my government name. Straight. I swear down. He's like Robert with big people now, you know. The old time thing's gone. Tiny. Understand the thing. Fat boy was Mark's jump up boy. He jumps for me now. Remember, it's been me out here, you know? When I come home last time, see one had the plug. They had the numbers. I had to use my brain and disarm them and take away the plug. They weren't showing him no real love. Pussy Den was trying to bully him, but I showed the plug real love. Had his back, hundred. See, one then popped down and ain't been relevant since. 
Tiny was thoughtful for a moment. He understood the game had changed, normal, and he respected the fact Fox to remain alive became richer and negotiated peace with the other side. Peace was better than war. He just wondered what Fox had sacrificed to persuade all of the main players to sign off the relevant peace deal. He also suspected that Fox had misread the chessboard and his quest for peace and or acceptance had cost him his life. West Coast had dropped Kenny. Therefore, Fox's decision to rebuild the thing and recruit from Ops was unacceptable. It was also fucking risky. I heard you paid off Boogie's brother Kevin, Tiny inquired. Fox laughed. Ha! <laughs> Kevin's close with Fat Boy, innit? When me and you went over there, you crushed their ego. You slapped off Boogie's face, slapped off Taylor's face, robbed him. Jack Zadai's Cartier kettle. I didn't touch Kevin. I think you did. You left with his Rolex and his balls. <laughs> Tiny laughed. 2001, he was sitting on the belly. Boogie had phoned and convinced him to throw him a bone. Light work. He liked Boogie. He was a funny guy. He'd sing, dance and clap whenever Tiny requested. The deal fell through. He told Boogie to sit on the four and a half. The old Boogie gave my shit to his brother and he's telling man it's in his safe house. Fat boy paid Kevin two racks. I heard you paid him, Tiny replied quickly. Fuck what you were, bloody. Between me and you, fat boy paid him to iron out the creases. He told him it was for me. I hear that. It's mad still. Fuck it. Link me when I land, in it. I drop a couple of boxes on you, a couple of gats and a change. Tiny hesitated. He had no intention of linking anyone. Nah, I'm good, bro. Rehabilitated. I'm chasing that deal with Netflix.